Hi, so you're back with one of uh, these interviews that I'm doing for Take Two. So I'm Jen, I work at Take Two, and um, today I'm joined by Catherine, and we're going to talk about infant mental health, so the mental health of babies and toddlers. Um, hi Catherine, how's it going? Hi Jen, good, how are you? Good, could you just give us a um, bit of an introduction to yourself please? So I'm Catherine McQueen and I'm a mental health social worker and I have worked with the Take Two program for about 10 and a half years now, which seems to have gone very fast. And I have some additional qualifications in infant mental health and um, mental health overall, so um, around parent mental health and um, children's mental health. Fantastic. Um, and so currently you're actually uh, Take Two's infant mental health specialist um, and internal consultant. So um, you're really skilled to talk about what we're going to talk about today. So I want to ask you a few questions and um, feel free to, you know, add some bits in if I've missed the, missed the mark on the questions. Um, so I know a little bit about infant mental health, but not as much as you. And I know that in utero, uh, a mother's stress can be quite damaging on an infant. Can you give me a bit of a full explanation about why that is? So um, I think um, in utero, um, infant development and the implications for infant mental health is an area of continuing research and, and the more we know, the more we realise we don't know. But what we do know is if a, a mum is under a significant pressure, all the stress hormones that are going through her body influences what's happening in, in her body growing and developing a really healthy and well baby. And that babies who are um, very, who have had in utero experiences where there's been lots and lots of stress hormones often are born um, as very unsettled babies or have very dysregulated systems. And so part of that could be that their mums have been under incredible pressure. So there's lots of cortisol and other stress hormones going on. Or there could be a combination of um, drug and alcohol use, poor nutrition, um, and lots of those things often go hand in hand. So that we know that the, the time that a baby grows and develops safely in utero is not as ideal as what we would normally like. And so often mums who I've worked with who um, have been very stressed or using substances during um, pregnancy often um, have had really poor access to antenatal care. And so that, you know, anything that could have sort of been helped or sorted out during that nine month period often goes unnoticed or unaddressed. Yeah, great. Excuse me. And I just want to clarify for those people who might be watching, we're not talking about just stress about getting to pick up older kids from school or kinder on time, are we? No, we're talking about really high level problems and worries. So, for example, um, really serious family violence, um, no access to good, safe housing, not enough money or resources to eat properly, or living... Um, I guess a lifestyle where there's lots of drug and alcohol use. So, you know, mum's not getting enough rest and her body's not getting enough nutrition. And, um, you know, and she's also not getting enough psychological space to think about her new baby. So that's the other part of being pregnant is, you know, having that psychological safety to really think about who is this baby and um, how are we going to be together and, and what your hopes and dreams are for you for your baby. Yeah, absolutely. So once the baby's born, those first three years or so, and five years, a lot of people um, increasingly saying, are really fundamental to the mental health ongoing of a person right in through to adulthood. Can you kind of give me a little bit more understanding about that? So what we know, particularly the first three years, is that um, the 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 rapid growth that happens both physically, emotionally, and through brain development for an infant is, is like no other period of time in, in your life. And so lots and lots of changes are going on. So if we think about a tiny little baby that's born, you know, seven pounds, and then by the time they're a toddler, you know, they're, um, they're walking, they're talking, they're running around and, um, and sometimes causing havoc in the world. So if we think about even just the physical growth that's happened during that period, you know, how much, um, how fast that happens and how much time and energy that is required for that to happen. So when there are problems or challenges in those first three years, because of the, the rapid change and growth that's going on, they are magnified like no other period of time in, in a child's life. But equally, 
the, the positive aspects are magnified as well. So if we work with children who've had some difficulties in those first three years of life, if we work in that period of time and we, we change um, their relationships or we improve um, you know, the caregiving that they're receiving or the nutrition that they're having, we can actually turn things around really quickly. So the positive aspects are magnified as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And um, I'm really keen to hear a little bit more about why good nurturing relationships in those period, those first three years, can be so beneficial. So we talk a lot about attachment and, um, you know, and attachment and relationships get used, those phrases get used, um, you know, by lots and lots of people. But what we're really talking about is a baby's first experience of a relationship. And what we all really want is we want that to be healthy and safe and secure. And so what a baby is doing, a baby is born into the world and they're very unregulated. They don't know. All they can do is cry and signal when they need, you know, food or comfort or if they're warm or cold. When, when their parent or their mum or dad comes to them and helps them feel a bit better, that baby quickly learns that actually you're a safe person and you're really helpful. So when you come, I cry and I, you come and do something, I feel a lot better. And they learn that over time, every time, I feel a bit better. So they start to go, okay, now I can actually move on to the next part of learning about the world. But they actually always know that that person who's always responded to them and who has helped them will be by their side. So as they go out and they explore, you know, a bit more of the world, if we think about toddlers, they know if that I cry, you know, mum or dad will help me or someone else trusted will help me. So I feel confident and safe. And so then I feel more confident to keep trying um, different things in the world and to keep learning and growing. Yeah, great. Does um, that make sense, Jen? It does, absolutely. Thank you. Um, lots of people uh, who might be watching this might be foster carers or kinship carers and think, well, I'm not the baby's mother. I'm not the baby's biological mother. Can you explain about how other people, other adults can actually provide that attachment? Yeah, and we and we can't take away that, you know, when, when babies go into foster care that they absolutely have suffered a loss and, and it isn't their mum or their dad. But what babies know is that they actually, if they have other people who are safe and who are predictable and reliable, they can start to learn that relationships with, with any safe um, caring adult can give them an experience that the world is a safe and predictable place. And that actually helps them feel more regulated, more safe. And so that actually gives them a really good solid base from which they can grow, they can relate to people, they can play and they can learn about the world. So absolutely, it's not, not their biological mum and dad, but having someone who can respond in the same way that we hope that mums and dads do so that when I'm crying at 3 a.m. in the morning, someone comes and that I'm, you know, I'm given a bottle or I'm given my dummy or I'm covered up or I'm given a cuddle. And when that happens repeatedly, I have the same experience of learning that the world is a safe place for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those people who might be caring for children that aren't theirs biologically, uh, what are some of the signs that an infant or so a baby or a toddler might be suffering some poor mental health? Um, so really early on, what we know is that little babies are really clever. They can, they can show us when things aren't going well for them. And so the really tricky part about small babies is that they can show us in really small ways or ways that we can miss because their states or their emotions can change really quickly. So often the first really clear indicator is that there's something's not going well for a small baby. And so a small baby, I mean 0 to 12 months, is that often they have feeding or settling problems or they might have um, low level illnesses that, you know, they might repeatedly get colds or they might have rashes. So they're really showing us through their body um, that their systems aren't settled and that they're not able to sort of really um, feel really, really well and, and go into routines that we'd like babies to, to go into. So like sleeping well and eating well. And then that has an effect on their whole system. So if we think about times when we haven't been eating well or sleeping well and how lousy we can feel, um, if we think what that's like for a small baby, that's really important. And then as babies get older, so once they become toddlers, um, often babies can show us through their, or toddlers can show us through their behaviour that they're really not coping very well. And they can show us in really one of two main ways. 
The, the first one is that probably we're all pretty common with his toddler tantrums, so that really dysregulated <laughs> toddler who, um, you know, often at Take Two we get referrals for, you know, toddlers who are biting and kicking and screaming and spitting and and that's really, that's really, really hard to be around and it's really hard to provide really safe caregiving for as well when a, ba when a toddler is in that state. And then the other toddlers that we worry about are the really closed down, quiet ones who who um, don't have very much affect so that they don't really show any emotions. They're very quiet. They're not playing very much. And they just almost, we would describe, they slide under the radar. So it's, it's kind of a survival strategy that they've developed that actually not drawing too much attention to their needs. Yeah, which could be really difficult for caregivers who might not know the baby well and they might think, oh, well, the baby's not crying um, and lying in its cot all night and it sleeps, you know, for hours on end when we know that maybe that baby's not actually asleep. And Yeah, that's a really good point, Jen. And, you know, often I've sat in meetings where people have said to me, this baby is such a good baby, they're sleeping all yeah. night already. But what we know developmentally is that... Um, their babies up to about six months of age are really wired to wake up during the night. You know, they need to be fed, they need comfort. And so for clinicians that take two, we sort of have our little antennas up so that if we hear those sorts of statements, we just explore a bit more to try and understand, you know, what's going on for this baby and, and maybe um, they're not able to signal what they need. Yeah, yeah. It's really important to realise that, I think. I think there's a lot of us who aren't from clinical backgrounds that might miss that, might think, oh, this baby is doing fine, it's not crying very much. So I really think that's important that we're passed on. Um, so when a caregiver is looking after for a baby, looking after a baby and they're keeping a really close eye on it and they are worried that it's showing some signs of uh, poor attachment with them as a caregiver or they're a bit worried about its mental health, are there things that caregivers can do to try and build that nurturing relationship? Absolutely. So I think, you know, what I talked about earlier on is being really responsive to a baby or a toddler's needs. So really, um, when a baby or toddler signals through their crying or their behaviour that they need attention, you know, um, make them the priority actually, and, and actually attend to them and attend to them in a way that the child can manage. So sometimes we have an idea about the type of help that a baby or toddler might need. But if a baby or a toddler um, has had lots of unsafe or unpredictable experiences, coming in and hugging them close yeah. can be actually really, really frightening. So really trying to match how we care for that baby or toddler in a way that feels helpful for them, not what we not we think not what we think it should be. Spending time playing. Um, yeah. Lots and lots of babies or toddlers that um, we work with at Take Two have never had the experience of, you know, really present and attuned adults who play at the level that the baby's at. So, you know, all those turn-taking games and, you know, making sounds with things and playing peekaboo, they're all really critical for, for brain development and for social and emotional development. So it's actually hard work that caregivers are doing with babies and toddlers. And providing a regular routine and... You know, I, I hear a lot about how sometimes contact can really disrupt routine, but actually trying to keep a routine as predictable and as developmentally appropriate as possible is really, really important. Yeah. And I guess the other one is limiting how many people um, are handling babies and toddlers. So what we know is that children who are in out-of-home care are often, you know, taken to contact by um, case support workers who they may yeah. not know. So sorry, so, just to interrupt you, you mean yeah. um, contact with their birth parents? Sorry, just to be yes. clear there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. sorry, contact. Yeah. So when they yeah. have time um, with their mum and dad or, or other yeah. family members, so sometimes... Yeah. Um, it's actually really, you know, trying to be the one who is home when the, when the baby arrives home from contact or is the one who pops them in the car. So um, making sure that, you know, the, the less number of people that are sort of holding and, and managing babies and toddlers is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, the reality is, unfortunately, that a lot of these little kids have gone through a couple of people before they actually come to their carer. So uh, that's really important to to sort of view it through the baby's eyes, if you like, that uh, they've been removed from their only people they've ever known and um, then been in, in two different other places since. Um, so to really give that baby some stability and understanding that you'll be there to look after, for, after them. 
Um, and I think that is a really important point, Jen. And we try to avoid that as much as we can, but sometimes in, it's inevitable. So yeah. communication between adults is really important. The more we communicate about, you know, what a baby likes or doesn't like, mm -hmm. or what their favourite toy is, or you know, here is the favourite toy, um, the more helpful that is. And they can feel like really little things, but they're actually really big things for babies and toddlers. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess a baby's experience is so limited because uh, their life is so short so far that, um, you know, even half an hour or half a day in somebody else's care uh, while they're being placed into a home can be a big deal. And babies are really aware of, you know, sights and sounds and smells in a, in a way that can feel really intense and overwhelming. And so absolutely thinking about those things is really important. Yeah, great. Um, so I want to ask you now a bit of a personal question. Why do you feel so passionately about infant mental health that you've made this your career? Um, it's a really good question. And I think um, I have worked with lots of older children and adults in, in my work across my career. And I suppose when I really go back to often when early problems or early warning signs about problems were starting, it often links back to in that infant stage or that toddler stage. So really thinking about is there something that we could do differently or help with um, infant mental health or toddler mental health at that very early stage? We've got a really great opportunity to change the pathway of someone's life. And we actually don't have to do a whole lot in that early stage because it's in those first three years of life. If we can help get things um, better or more right at that point in someone's life, you know, the whole idea of um, avoiding a lifetime of suffering is, is really important. Absolutely. I um, couldn't agree with you more from an outsider, non-clinical point of view, that it appears that short interventions early on in life and early on in the problem can radically transform the outcomes for people, both in terms of uh, their interactions with systems and stuff, but also in terms of their happiness and uh, their ability to go and create happy relationships with other people uh, as they get older. It's incredible um, to watch that in action when I work at Take Two. And the other really important part is too, when, when a baby is born, it's often um, a new opportunity. We know from the research that parents um, are often more open to supports or changes. So even though, you know, we often have referrals where there's been a number of children removed from, from biological parents' care, but each child is an individual in their own right and the relationship they have with their parents. So it's an, it's an opportunity for something to be a little bit different within this family. And I think that's really important for us to all remember because, you know, when you've been working in the system for a long time, you can become a little bit, um, you know, a little bit worn down by the repeated patterns that we see. So it's really important to think that it's it's a new opportunity within a family. Absolutely. And there are skills that you can learn um, to parent and to look after kids and they're not that hard, um, you know, about interacting with your baby and um, being playful. Uh, and being there is the most important bit really, isn't it? That's right. We often talk about that, you know, buying lots of toys or clothes for babies, yeah. but actually what they need, they need is an adult who can um, comfort them, be present and be available. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Catherine. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.